Who is God? <clears throat> now, we, we use God all the time. It's like, hey, God this, God that. Do you know God? Yes, I know God. Do you really know God, though? Who is God? And so, in our effort to build up some, some core Bible doctrines, I got thinking, you know, I think it's important for our church family to have a deeper understanding of who God is. Now, God has given us, we've been looking at a lot of different things, God has given us His very words. It's called, ready? Not hard. The Bible. He's given us His very words. He breathed them out, and He gave them to us. It's instruction book for life. See, God has revealed to us who He is in the Scriptures, through general revelation, we looked at this last week, so you can see the, the stars and, and the nature and all the created things. We see the general things that everybody can see, the world can see. In fact, last week we saw the fact that, that not, not even um, unbelievers have any excuse because unbelievers, when they look at the beauty of the earth and all the created things, they have to be, the, the created things are declaring there is a God. There is a God and you need to know Him. And so as Christians now, we also have something called special revelation where God begins to reveal Himself even deeper in the Scriptures. And so we're on this journey where we're beginning to understand who God is on a deeper level. And so today we're going to talk about who God is in the Scriptures. Now, we get this all the time. People tell us who God is. Well, God is a loving God. He would never do this. Now, hold on. He is a loving God, but you have left out a whole lot of other things. And so when we begin to look at the Scripture, what the Bible actually says about who God is, we begin to have a much clearer picture. So let's dig in a little bit here. We're going to talk about a few attributes. Now, we, we, I don't like to use big words here because big words, um, well, I don't like to. Anytime I use big words, we try to define them so we all are on the same page. Maybe that's the best way to say it. So let's talk about attributes. Let's define this really quick. Webster defines it as this, a quality, a character or characteristic ascribed to someone or something. So we're going to look at the qualities that are ascribed to God in the Bible. Now, the world ascribes all kinds of ideas about who God is, but we're going to look at what the Bible says who God is. Remember who wrote the Bible? God spoke it, used holy men to write down His words. And so it's God saying, this is who I am. So maybe we should believe what the Bible tells us, not what the world tells us that, that they think God is. All right, so we look at the attributes of God. So the attributes of God is the quality, the character, or the characteristics of who God is. Now let's look at this. God reveals himself in two primary ways. The first way is natural attributes. Natural attributes. I don't have my clicker, Tim. So natural attributes are the very nature of God's being, unique only to God, and cannot be possessed by man. So the attributes of God that cannot be uh, uh, possessed by us, like we can't even have these attributes. These are the natural attributes of God. God is naturally this way. You and I have to learn things, yes? And some of us have natural skills, natural gifts, right? Some of you are naturally inclined to think deep. Some of you are naturally to learn uh, with your hands or naturally learn with your eyes or naturally learn from reading. So we all have natural things that are ascribed to us. When we are created, God created us unique, and so we're all unique. Can you imagine what the world would look like if we were all the same? Man, that would be boring. You know, we all have the same pictures on the wall. Have you ever been to, um, there, there's certain establishments, like um, I, I like Tropical Smoothie because uh, I like their, their mocha madness. You go into any tropical smoothie, anywhere in the world, they have the exact same pictures on the wall. And at first, when the very first time I experienced this food chain, I went and I thought, wow, that's a cool picture. I wonder where they got that from. I should ask this manager where they got it from. I, I really like this picture. It's like a picture of a dock and all this stuff. And then I went into a different one. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. For example, if you ever went into a Cracker Barrel, what are you guarantees to see hanging on the walls? Antiques. Why? Because they're all the same. I learned that they actually have a warehouse full of antiques, full of them, just to keep their stores or the restaurants full of antiques. Now, with God, there are natural things that we can see about God that naturally exist, but we can't have them. We, we, can't, uh, we can't attain them. They, they will never be a part of our lives and our abilities. The natural attributes are are the very nature of God's being, unique 
only to God and cannot be possessed by men. So we're going to look at a whole bunch of them. I'm going to do my best to stick to my notes so we get out on time. But every one of these apply to your life. And you need to be asking yourself, well, if this is who God is, what does this mean to my life? Let's dig in. God is above all created things. In, in, in the big churchy realm, we would call this transcendence. God is above all created things. Can you imagine a created something saying, hey, I'm better than you? No, I created you. Here's what the Bible says about this. In the beginning, when? In the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, the creator is above all created things. In the very beginning, nothing existed. God said, I'm going to speak you into existence. God is above his creation. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, the first part of that verse says this. He says, for thus says the high and lofty one. High and lofty, like he's over all things. Who inhabits eternity? Whose name is holy? He's trying to make a point. I created you. So get over it. I'm over all created things. That's a lesson our world needs to learn, isn't it? Hey, that's a lesson that we need to learn. That when we're facing crazy things in life and we think things are out of control, oh, but God is over everything. He is transcendent. God is above all created things. Number two, through God, or I'm sorry, though God is above all created things, God chooses to be personally involved with his creation. God chooses to be personally involved. Now, many of you guys know that I, on occasion I teach religions classes, and I will tell you that there are a lot of religions out there where the people following the religion, they're just hoping that their religious belief, their, their higher power, if you will, is watching. I hope he's watching this. I'm doing a good deed. We have a God who chooses to get involved with you and I on a personal level. Here's what the Bible says. John chapter 3, verse 16. We all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son. What did he do? He sent his Son. He personally got involved with his creation. Why? Because we were destined for hell. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Through him. God sent his son to personally interact and engage in his creation. You won't find that in any other religion. John chapter 10, verse 10. God just didn't purposely engage his creation. He says, hey, the thief comes not except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Have you guys memorized this verse yet? I use it a little bit. We have a God who says, I want to personally get involved with my creation. Not that they would just have life, but they would have it more abundant. Because that's the life I wanted for them from the beginning. The psalmist declares, the Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. It's interesting that we forget the truth part sometimes. The world says, I called on God once. Yeah, but is He really your God? Or are you just calling on Him because other people do? In our Bible study this week, we were talking about uh, the Apostle Paul and, and, and how these, these people were running around trying to cast out demons, and these, these guys are going in, and they're casting out demons. And, and I, I call you to remove yourself from this person because in, in the name of the, of, of the God that Paul preaches about, <laughs> in the name of this Jesus guy, and the demon's like, listen, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but I have no clue who you are. And he attacks him. We have a world, we have a world that's saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to call on God. I'm just going to apply my truth to who God is. No, God has truth. He has laid it out for us in the Scriptures, and the more we spin here, the more we begin to understand truth. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? You see, God chooses to engage His creation. He chooses to be close. If you are a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. He's not just beside you. He's in you. You have a God who chooses to involve himself in every decision in your life. Every day he is there. Number three, God is eternal, meaning he has no beginning and no end. You see, God is not limited by time or space. He's not. 
God, when will you show up? God, I've been praying about this forever. God's like, listen, <laughs> you know, your idea of time has no concept in, in heaven. Your idea of time, this, this, I don't apply to that. So God is eternal. He has no beginning, no end. Here's what the psalmist declares, verse, uh, chapter 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world. So even before creation itself, from the everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Here's what he's saying. Time has no bearing on me, for I am God. So God is everlasting. He is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. Therefore, God is infinite and is not bound by any limitation. So, sometimes I've had these conversations with individuals, and they're like, man, I just don't know if God is willing. Now, hold on. There's nothing holding them back. Have you ever, and, and I've heard this before, man, God would never forgive me of this. This is so horrible. I'm like, now, hold on. God's not bound by your sense of shame and guilt. He is, has no limitation. You see, God is without any limits. His attributes, the very attributes that we're talking about here, have no boundaries. They are without limit. You see, God exists outside of and is not limited by time or space. He is limitless. Here's what the Bible talks about God's limitlessness. Great is our Lord and greatly or in mighty and power, his understanding is infinite. Another psalm, but the mercy of the Lord. Mercy, we're going to talk about that in a moment. I don't deserve his mercy, but I get it anyways. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. On those who fear him and his righteousness to the children, or to children's children. Another psalm, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. You see, we have a God who has no boundaries. He has no limits. He can do whatever He wants. That is an amazing attribute of God because when we face issues in life, when we're facing things that just don't make sense, when we're facing things that seem so big that we will never come out from underneath the weight and the burden of it, you have a God who's not bound by any limits. And you can cry out to Him and say, God, I can't know if I can carry this. God's like, yeah, you can't, but that's nothing compared to what I can do. Jesus is talking to some people, and he says, listen, he, they're saying, hey, because of their holiness, because of their righteous, because of their righteous works and all this stuff, they're saying, hey, look at me, you know. And Jesus is saying, listen, no righteous man can reach heaven. And you're like, what do you mean righteous man can't get to heaven? And God says, it's, it's all through me. It's all through me. Here's what he says, but with God, all things are possible. You see, even our salvation is based on who? Jesus Christ, not, not anything we do. It's our willingness to surrender to His plan, His way, His salvation, His gift, the gospel. When we surrender that, God says, okay, fine, I'll save you. I'll, I'll redeem you. You are now my child. I will adopt you into my family, and it's my righteousness that clothes you, not yours. See, we don't get to heaven by our righteousness. We get there because of His finished work on the cross of Calvary. Nothing is impossible with God. Because of, because, of, because God is infinite, He is not limited by our understanding and could do amazing work in the world around us and our lives beyond our understanding. We face the impossible. We can be reminded then that nothing is impossible with God. I don't know what you're going through. I know some of you, you got some hard things you're working through. Listen, nothing is impossible with God because He's limitless. He's a powerful God. Number five, God never changes. He's not capable or susceptible of change. You see, we need to be reminded of that. We have a culture that's constantly changing, and now it seems like it's trying to change back. <laughs> but it's constantly changing. God has never changed. His principles have remained the same. In fact, the, the one book mankind has had from, from really the beginning of time that has sold more copies than any other book in history contains the principles and truths of God, His virtues, His morals, His teachings. It's never changed. Society can change all at once, but this does not change. God is never changing. He does not change. 
He is unchanging. Here's what Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I am the Lord. Ready? In case you're wondering, God has said it himself. For I am the Lord. I do not, ready, change. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. You see, the sons of Jacob are facing hardship. They're going through some hard stuff. And God's saying, are, are you forgetting who I am? I don't change, so stop worrying about this. I got this. You see, when you spend time in the Bible and you begin to read some of the stories of the Old Testament and you see God come through for His people, or you see in the New Testament where God begins to come through uh, for His people and, and those who are willing to walk by faith, and you begin to realize that nothing that life throws at me is too big for God because He doesn't change. And throughout Scripture, He has proved Himself faithful to His followers and His believers. He never changes. And because He never changes, I can walk in faith knowing that God's got my back. When I go into the hospital, God's got my back. When I get the phone call, horrible things, God's got my back. This doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. This means that God will carry you through and God will be glorified in whatever you're going through if you're willing to surrender to His will and His way. Man, I, I've got a, uh, had a really good friend back east he went in for stage four cancer, and he truly believed in his heart of hearts, God still is not done with me. We walked in the, went to the hospital, and they, they found, man, you, the doctor's like, oh, good luck, pal. He says, no, 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 God's not done with me. God's not done with me. And the entire time he's in the hospital, and they're like, I don't see in this happening. He is declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. His testimony alone was enough to break through hearts because the Holy Spirit was using that. And people, I guarantee you, we will meet people in heaven who his testimony influenced while he was in the hospital. And if God had taken him in that moment, God had used his life for his glory because there will be people in heaven because of his testimony. But he beat all the odds. And all the doctors were amazed at how God raised him up. And he was getting carted out of his room. And if you know anything about hospitals, a lot of times they don't let you walk out. they got to wheel you out. You know. And you always get some random person you've never met before, right? You know, He gets some random lady, starts wheeling him out. She stops about 15 feet from the ex exit. She says, this entire hospital has been hearing your testimony, how you've declared you're going to walk out of this place. I could get fired for this, but I want you to get up and walk. And he did. Here is a person he had never met before who heard his testimony. You see, God, God can do anything he wants. God never changes, and he declared, God, you're not done with me. I know you're not done with me. And he has been sharing his faith in the gospel and, and his miraculous testimony with, with people even to this day, believe it or not. He's beat all the odds because God never changes. God is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knew what the past was going to be. He knows what your present is. And get this, ready? He even knows your future. He is all-knowing. Now, when you're facing the unknown, isn't it nice to know that your God who says, hey, uh, I want you to have a life more abundant. I want, I want what's best for your life. I, I want to use your life to bring glory and honor and praise to me. Isn't it nice to know that God knows what's about to happen? We're, we're sometimes like clueless, like, I have no idea, God. And God's like, I get that, but I know what's going to happen. I know the future. Isaiah 46, verse 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel is shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. You know who's in control? God. When we are clueless and we're facing unknown and uncertainty, guess who's still in control? God. Guess who knows what's about to happen? God. Why? He is all-knowing. And listen, if God had taken my friend to heaven that day in the hospital... God had used him for his glory 
But God is still using him for his glory today. Why? Because he's willing to say, God, it's another day. Let's do something. You see, when we learn to live our lives for God and not self, our perspective changes. God, if you want to take me home today, just be glorified in it somehow. Be glorified. God never changes. God is all-knowing. God is present everywhere at all times. God is present everywhere at all times. It's called omnipresent, everywhere present. Jeremiah 23, verse 23, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not feel, listen, do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? Can I tell you something about God? He's here right now. He's everywhere all the time. Isn't it amazing when we pray sometimes, God, let me tell you about my day, as if he doesn't know? (laughs) He's fine with you talking about your day, but we need to realize something. When we're going through that hard time, God's right there. He knows. God, you saw what happened today. Yeah, I did. Trust me. Trust me. God is everywhere present, omnipresent. Because God is omnipresent, we can know that He never leaves us. He is always with us, and He is always at work. In fact, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 tells us that God will never leave us or forsake us. By the way, do you know who is not omnipresent? Our enemy. Satan made me do it. No, you're not that important. Sorry, neither am I. Now, he has a third of the angels have fallen. And I guarantee that those angels are at work, those those fallen angels, um, they're at work trying to create all kinds of havoc in our lives. But know this about God. He's never left you. He will never forsake you. And even the darkest of moments, whether you realize it or not, he might even be carrying you. So learn to trust him. Trust him in it. God is all-powerful and able to do whatever He desires. He's omnipotent. See, He created all things. He sustains all things. So He determines the events of life, and and existence itself is held up by His very Word. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. You know what those are? Governments. Thrones or dominions or principles or power. All things were created through him and, ready, for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now, speaking of the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we, when we have the Lord's Supper here, often we get to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Concerning marriage supper of the Lamb, here's what we read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude As the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. This is an adoring, um, uh, it's an exclamation of of adoring God, okay? I mean, it's the best way to say it. And here's what these voices are saying. Hallelujah. Here's what they're saying. Ready? For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. You see, He's all-powerful, and He's reigning. He's all-powerful, and He's in control of your life. He's all-powerful, and nothing can happen without His approval. He's all-powerful. He can do whatever He wants because He's all-powerful. The psalmist discovers this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Say, man, I don't know what's going on in life, but God's got this. God's got this. All right, those are the natural attributes of God. Let's look at the moral attributes of God. This is how God reveals His personal interaction with mankind, okay? You see, not only does God have attributes that 
are His only, the ones we can't possess. We can't be all-knowing. We can't be everywhere present. We can't be all-powerful. We just can't. But yet God shares some things with us. He engages us on a level in which we can, we can experience who He is and what He's doing. And those are attributes that should be part of every Christian's life. These are the moral attributes of God. They're revealed in His personal interaction with mankind. So the natural attributes of God cannot be, or cannot be possessed. Let's see here. Yeah, the natural attributes of God cannot be possessed by mankind, but God's moral attributes are shared with us, okay? So we have natural, those are all about God. Moral, those, those are shared with us. Those, those are things that God wants us to engage in. So these should be characteristics of God that we should strive to model in our own lives. When we see a characteristic of God, and we see many times that like God's love and God's grace and God's patience and all kinds of things in Scripture, when we see those things, we should say, hey, my life should model that. My life should model that faith. My life should model that trust. My life should model what we see in Scripture, the moral attributes of God. For example, God is holy, meaning He is perfect and without sin. Holiness. Because it is written, be holy... For I am holy, we read in 1 Peter. So our lives, a characteristic that we should share with God is, because He is holy, we too should be holy without sin. Now let's talk about that for just a moment. We had a whole series about why is it that I'm, I'm supposed to be holy and, and I'm made new, and, and, and I'm, but, but I still sin. Why do I keep sinning? It's because we have the Holy Spirit residing in us, and the Holy Spirit is doing work in us, and we need to learn to surrender and walk in the Spirit. It's when we stop walking in the Spirit that we begin to sin again. It's when we, when we leave the spirits prompting, hey, this doesn't belong in your life, or hey, we need to work on this in your life, and we, we refuse and we reject and we fight against that, and that's when we find ourselves sinning. But God says, be holy, for I am holy. How on earth can we be holy? By God's work in our lives. Not by our own strength, but by surrendering to the Spirit of God. And hey, by the way, we are clothed in the very righteousness of God. And so we are compelled by God Himself to walk in holiness. First John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. See, our holiness is not based on our righteous works. Man, i got to keep driving that home. Why? Because in the Americanized church, we have all these people who think that good works makes God happy. No, good works are a byproduct of God already working in us. God is thrilled with that. For if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's His finished work that cleanses us from sin. But we need to learn to surrender to the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit. God is just in fulfilling the law He has imposed on mankind regarding sin. Now, we've got to talk about this one for just a moment. Who said, for the wages of sin is death? God. This is something God has imposed on mankind. He says, listen, you're going to sin against me, you'll be condemned. Now, what we have the sin nature we, we can thank Adam for, right? All mankind, according to John chapter uh, 3, verse uh, 17 through 19, we are all born in condemnation. We are born that way. And God sent His Son not to condemn us, because we're already condemned, but to save us. So God is just in fulfilling the law. He says, this is, the law says, because of sin, death. In fact, God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments, and you know, the, the, four, uh, the five books of, of Moses saying, hey, don't do this, 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 don't do this. And, and, and basically, the bottom line is, is nobody, could do all the, or nobody could live without doing some of the don'ts. Everyone broke the Ten Commandments. In fact, the Ten Commandments were given to us so that the world would know, you can't do this on your own. Look, I have fulfilled them all. It's called pride. You just broke it, <laughs> you know. We can't do it on our own. So God is just in fulfilling the law. See, God cannot act contrary to His laws. Let's talk about this. If God has said it, if God has said it, God will not act contrary to it. So when we say, I know what the Bible says, but 
We're saying that God will act contrary to what He has said. God does not do that. He will not do that. A person must then, because of God's condemnation of sin, a person must then suffer for his sin. The punishment for sin is what? Death. But then what? I'm going to die for my own sin. Now what? You're dead. Congratulations. There's no turning back. But God, on the other hand, says, you know what? I will send my son to make payment for that death penalty. Why? Because he was a spotless, perfect sacrifice with no sin to make payment for the sins of mankind. So God is just in fulfilling that requirement through His Son, Jesus Christ. The psalmist says this, The Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared His throne for judgment. So there is judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. Meaning, when He judges the world, He will judge it rightly. There is no mishandling of the rules or laws. He will justly judge the world. And so he says, listen, if you will come to me through my son Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, forgiven. So when you stand before God, God says, oh, that's a child. But if you choose to reject Jesus Christ, he's saying, okay, you have chose judgment. Judgment. The Rom- Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commendeth What's that word mean? To favorably introduce something. What did he favorably introduce? His love to us. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, so we were sinners, we were condemned. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. From wrath. Judgment. Through him. You see, God is just. God is just in fulfilling the law. God is righteous and will always do right. God is righteous. For example, when God comes to Abraham and says, hey, we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because <laughs> there's bad stuff going on there. God sends a messenger to Abraham and tells him his plan is to destroy the city. And Abraham then pleads with God. Why does Abraham plead with God? Because he has family there. Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, far be it from you to do such a thing. Why? Because Abraham knows that God is righteous. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked. So that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? So he begins to plead with God. He says, well, what if there are 50 people there? And God says, well, if there are 50 people there. What about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? All the way down to just lost family. And God says, you know what? We'll remove them first. Because he does what is right all the time. God is love. Anybody ever hear this attribute of God? God is love. He would never send anyone to hell. No, he doesn't send anyone to hell. They choose hell by rejecting Jesus Christ, and God honors that in eternity. You chose to reject me. I will honor that decision in eternity. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us, ready, God is love. Do you think that we should take some of that love that God has showed to us and showed to others? Hey, by the way, the love that God showed us was when we were His enemies, Well, now let's apply that to showing that to others when we don't want to show them love. Wow, man, God showed me love. I should show love to others. John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that to lay down one's life for his friends. You see, love seems to be everyone's favorite attribute of God, but yet we forget about his holiness. We forget about his righteousness, his justness. My God is the greatest. He demands justice for sin. Yet, he offers through his love payment for that sin. We focus on love because it points to God's great mercy and forgiveness. God's love is a great attribute to point at. The world needs to know about God's love, but we need to make sure they understand what that love is, what it means, because that will lead to another attribute of God, God's mercy. You see, God is merciful. It's his compassion for sinners in not giving us what we deserve. you imagine if God were to give us what we really deserve? 
We'd be in big trouble, wouldn't we? But his mercy. Instead of condemnation, he offers forgiveness and salvation. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the uh, remnant of his heritage? He does not remain he, he does not remain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You see, in Hebrews also, the word mercy comes from this, the same root word from a mother's womb, okay? So consider this, a baby is helpless in a mother's womb. In the same sense, without God's mercy, we are helpless in light of our sin. Just as a child is helpless in mom's womb, we are helpless without God's mercy. We can't do this on our own. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's His plan. Only through me can you reach the Father. God is gracious. God is gracious. His grace offers goodness toward those who deserve punishment. Have you ever felt like, man, God's going to get me for this? But yeah, He's gracious. You see, God offers His grace to those of us who we know. We deserve punishment. No, no, no. I'm going to show you my grace anyways. Instead, I will show you grace. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, grace is God's love demonstrated on the cross toward us, mankind, human beings who merit the opposite, death. But yet, we gain His great love. Colossians, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, verse 5, verse, chapter 5, verse 21, for He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of of God in Him. See, God is God. He is good. He is gracious toward us. And because He created us and desires a relationship with us, and and that relationship then begins with salvation, Jesus Christ, God says, listen, I know what you really deserve, but I'm going to offer grace instead. God is good. Aren't you glad you have a good God? You imagine a God like some of these other religions believe in like, oh, you messed up. Oh, you messed up. Oh, you messed up, man. Man, we would all be done. (laughs) But we have a good God, an amazing God. The psalmist declares, the Lord is good to all. And His tender mercies over all His works. Another psalm, the praise the Lord, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. God is good. Finally, God is true and faithful true and faithful. You see, God's truthfulness means that He is the true God, the one true God, and that all His knowledge and words are both true and the final standard of truth. He not only gave us a Bible that is true, it is truth itself. God is true, but He's also faithful. God's faithfulness means that He will keep every promise. He is reliable, He is steadfast, and He is unwavering. And so when you are wavering, when you are worried, when you feel like I am about to crumble underneath the weight of whatever is happening in life, understand this, God is faithful, He is unwavering, He is reliable, He is steadfast, and He is right there with you. And maybe your prayer needs to be, God, I can't hold the burden of this anymore. Would you take over and learn to lay it down? Don't pick it up, lay it down. And even if necessary, God, I need you to carry me through this because I can't do this any longer. The words of Solomon, 1 Kings chapter, uh, King chapter 8, verse 50, 56. Blessed be the Lord. He's reflecting on all the stuff God's has done. Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to His people, Israel. According to all that He promised, everything He promised, God did. There has not failed one word of His good promises which he promised through his servant, Moses. Here's what he's reflecting upon. Through God, or through Moses, God made all these promises to the children of Israel, and God kept every one of them, and you have a good and faithful 
God. He remains true to His Word, and He will remain true to you, His children, today. But we must learn to trust in a true and faithful God. In the hardest of moments, are you willing to bend a knee and say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I hand it over to you. And God's saying, finally, you trust me enough to take care of this business. We have a good, good God. And I hope that as you begin to think about who God is, you begin to realize how powerful He can be in your life when you learn to rest and surrender and trust and pray His mercies over whatever it might be. And God, I need your goodness in this. God, I need your faithfulness. God, I need you to intervene here. Trust God. And when you begin to trust Him, you, you begin to pray to Him, and you begin to see Him work in your life. Let me tell you something. Your faith will be strengthened, and the enemy will realize, hey, they've grown another step in their spiritual walk. Can't get them there anymore because they've learned to trust God here. 